Das ist nur mein. <laughs> Welcome back to Campus Party 2013 at the Galileo stage. We're here joined to close today's um, stage with Nate George, who will be giving us a talk on water cooling. Round of, round of applause, please, for Nate George. Check. We going? Excellent. So what I was saying was that I'm going to be filling in for the lovely Hans Peter over here because he's not feeling very well. So this is his presentation. So I'm going to kind of run through it and give you guys a good foundation over what water cooling is, how it works, and how it can improve your system. So the basics is what is water cooling? Uh, water cooling is cooling the essentials of your computer using water or a fluid rather than air. Now, most people in here will know that your computer is going to generate heat. You're going to generate heat through your processor and your other components in there. And generally, what you'll have is a heat sink, and then you'll have your fans inside, and it'll take the heat away, and it'll take the exhaust, the air out with the heat. So the option is you can change from the air. You can go to water cooling. And the process runs from there. So the process runs through taking the fluid over the blocks taking the heat away and then taking it out through the radiator. So we're going to go a bit in deeper here and we'll start off by some frequently asked questions. So, do you use water in water cooling? Uh, we've got some fluid over the side there and it's not actually water, it's a water based. I mean they started off using distilled water with some biocides in, some additives to stop algae growth and also to improve thermal performance. It's kind of moved on a lot since then and now you have colours, you have other additives, you have performance additives and you also have things like glitter and stuff like that to kind of use on displays and shows. So it's not actually water, but it has, you know, it has got water principles in it. Is water cooling dangerous? Uh, water cooling is dangerous like anything if you don't do it right. I mean, when you're doing your water cooling loop, if you leak test and you make sure that everything's nice and tight in there, you use good quality merchandise, then you're going to be absolutely fine. And as time's gone on, more money and more money has been invested into water cooling. So you have a lot of companies that are now bringing out more easier to use and more stable components. So it's now, if you're going to get into it, now's the kind of time to get into it. Uh, what are the advantages to water cooling? Well, for a start, it looks awesome. Like if you've got a case window and you look in your computer and you've got water in there and lights, it just looks incredible. It looks so much better than air cooling. So that's probably number one. Uh, you're also going to have a lot lower temperatures, which means you're going to be able to push your system harder. Uh, and it's going to be quieter. I mean, if you have your fan running on your heat sink and you have it running at full blast, it's creating a lot of noise. Or if you go with water cooling, you can have your pump running at a low RPM, and sometimes you won't even need to turn your fans on. So you can literally run your system completely fanless. Uh, and we're away again. So the components of a basic water cooling system are... I'll come over here now. We have the pump, and we've got an EK pump here, which is kind of on the lower end of the market. We run through right from the EK pumps, which probably range about 30 pounds. We can go right up to some higher end pumps, which can be around 70 to 80 pounds, or even higher. Uh, they're all quite good. I mean, the higher end you go, generally you're going to get a better flow rate. You're going to get lower noise, lower vibrations. So you kind of have to balance up what your budget is against what you need to go for. So that's the little EK pump there. I actually use one of these at the moment as a little stand-in, and it's pretty good. It's a little bit noisy at times, but it does the job and it keeps everything cool. And then we run through into the reservoir. Now, again, there's a hundred different types of reservoirs you can get. This here is like your standard tube reservoir. It will come with two brackets on the side here and here, so you can mount it into your loop. And then you've also got the type of reservoir, which is the bay res. They've got like a 3.5 inch bay res here, and this will slot into a drive, same as what your floppy will be in. And then you can fill it up through the fill port at the top here, and you can also get a nice display from the front. So both, both are easy. You know, you get these in 3.5, you also get these in 5.2 instead of a DVD drive. Both are great. 
Uh, what you want to remember when you're doing your reservoir is that when you're setting up your loop, you want to try and put your reservoir in a higher point in your system. So it's going to make it a lot easier to fill your loop. Because what you want to do is you want to prime your pump. So you want your pump drawing in for the inlet being underneath the reservoir. So that when you put your reservoir in, you can put a fill loop up from here or you can just put a funnel on the top. You can put the water in. That's going to run down here, prime the pump, and then when you turn your pump on, you're ready to go. Next, we have the fans. I have no fans here, but everyone knows what a fan looks like. They go on the radiator and they assist in blowing the air through the radiator and then cooling the radiator, which in turn cools the loop down to a room ambient temperature. Uh, you can either put the fans on in a pull configuration or a push configuration. Either one's going to work, but one's going to create a lot more dust on the other side. If, you'll put, if you put your fans on here and you're pulling air through, you're going to get a lot of dust on this back side. So you can just stick a hoover on there and quickly get rid of it. If you've got it on a push configuration, you're going to draw the dust into the fans and it's all going to get stuck. And you're going to have to take away the whole you know, thing to get actually into it. So pull's a bit easier to actually clean. And fittings. On the fittings, there's three real types of fittings you can go for. And I'd say the most popular moment is a compression fitting because it's easy to go for quick and easy and really stable. But you've also got the barbs like we've got here. But the problem with the barbs is, is if you're using a tubing which is slightly too big and you're not confident in the tubing, it, with the pressure it can pop off or it can work its way loose. Now you can get like a, a zip tie or a Jubilee clip or something like that which I've got here. So you've got like a Jubilee clip here with like a Phillips head on the side. You can undo that, put that over the top of the tubing and then tighten it up and that will hold it in place and keep it from falling off. But uh, personally, I think for anyone that's just starting water cooling to go for a compression fitting because you've just got, so it's so much easier. You just thread the tubing through here and then mount it over the top and then just tighten it up. And once you've screwed it together, you'll feel a bit of a tightness and then that will be a really solid hold that will never come undone. You'll really struggle to get that undone. So even with the pressure of you know two or three D5 pumps, which are a really powerful pump, you're still not going to pop off a compression fitting, and it's nice and quick. Uh, the other fitting you have is like a push fitting, which I haven't got here, but that basically needs a stronger like PUR hose, and then you just literally press inside, and it's got a little clasp inside that holds onto the hose. It's really quick and easy, and it was you know when water cooling first started, it was what everyone was using, but things have moved on now onto the safer option of the compression fitting. So I'd say look at your options, kind of weigh up how confident you are with it. I mean, if you're a plumber by trade, then you kind of know what you're doing, but if you have never done water cooling before, then go for a compression fitting without a doubt. Uh, hoses. Now hoses go on from the fittings quite nicely. Once you've chosen your fittings and you've chosen something you want to go with, that kind of denotes on your hose in the same way around. Because obviously you get different colored hoses and different colored fittings and stuff. Once you've chosen the type of hose you want, the type of fittings you want, you kind of match them two together and then you're away to go. Uh, the different hoses you can get, like this here's Tigon, which is kind of renowned as the best brand to use. So it's nice and flexible and you can get a really good bend on it without the coat hose kinking. Uh, it is quite soft though, and it does tend to take on the dye if you're using like a dye from a liquid, it tends to take on that. So have a look through different hoses, kind of work out what you want to do, look at the reviews of the hoses, go into the forums and look at what people have used, and that's probably the best way to work out what you need to do for your own loop. And the fluid, we've well, kind of done the fluid in the last one, so... But yeah, so like I said, the fluid, you've got different colors, different styles, and there's so many different brands out now that are all trying to kind of compete with each other to get the best on the market. So it really does pay, especially like I said, in water cooling now with all the competition, it really pays to look on the market and see what's going to be best for you at this point in time. But uh, that's that slide done, I believe. The pump. Okay, I think I've kind of just cleared all these, haven't I? <laughs> the water blocks. Okay, so... If we go over to here and look at the water blocks. So like I said before, you've got the processor, you've got the graphics card, and you've got other parts in your computer which generate heat. And if you look at the processor, everyone who's put a heat sink on a computer knows you've got the flat surface, you put on the thermal compound and then put on your water block. Uh, it's the same principle with the water block. You can see on the back here, it's got a copper and a nice smooth surface. This is the contact surface. It's going to go onto your processor. So you'll mount this into your computer, onto your CPU. And inside here, you've got an inlet and an outlet. And inside, there's lots of little fins or channels over the board, over this back plate. So what will happen is the fluid will come in through the pump, 
and it will transfer over all these little channels, which gives a really high conductive surface because you've got loads of surface area in there. The fluid will then take all the heat, move through into the radiator, and then it will cool it, and as it will move back around, the cycle will continue. And it's the same process. If you have a GPU or you have any other block in your system, to come through the CPU, go through the fins, lose the heat, and then move through into the next block, take the heat, move through, and it'll go into the radiators. And you can just keep on adding things into the loop as you go for more and more hardware. Uh, every block's different. I mean, in the market at the moment, there is hundreds and hundreds of blocks you can choose from. And nowadays, all blocks on the inside will have some kind of fin structure. They'll have some kind of core structure where the fluid will transfer over for maximum uh, thermal conductivity. So you can really kind of look through. If you look through stats from all the different blocks, you'll notice that some of the blocks will only have a one or two degree difference. And unless you're looking to do massive overclocks on your computer, if you're just a casual gamer or a web browser and you want it for the looks and the quietness, then really choose a block that's going to meet your system requirements, that's going to look the best, that's going to fit in with your build, and then you're not going to go far wrong with that. Radiators we've done, the fitting and hose we've done, fluid we've done and thermal paste. Now, this should play a video. Yeah. Okay, so what I was saying earlier about the, about the block. So, if anyone's put a heatsink on before, like an a afterstock heatsink, you'll notice that you have to take off your processor and then you'll have to go onto there and place your heatsink in place. Now, there's hundreds of ways from spots and crosses and H's and everything, but this video just goes through a few of the best methods on applying that. And what this is doing here is Basically, when you're connecting two surfaces, so you can see the processor surface there. Uh, what we're trying to do is, when we're putting the copper surface here and the nice flat shiny surface onto the processor, even if you look down at a micron level, you'll see there's slight scratches and slight imperfections in the surface here. And that will mean that you're not getting the best possible contact onto the processor. So by using a thermal grease or a pad, when we press this onto here, the thermal grease fills all the little cracks, fills all the little scratches, and then we'll get a much better contact surface and a much better temperature overall. We've got the cross method here, which is probably the two most popular ones must be the cross method and then also the spot method in the middle. As you can see by when he presses the piece of uh, acrylic down there, it's got the best surface contact over all the methods. Okay. So next in the slides we have the actual setup. And again, I think I've actually kind of covered this in a little bit of detail a little bit earlier. So, I mean, if anyone's got any questions after, we can go over everything uh, in a lot more detail uh, afterwards in the Q&A session. But, I mean, the basic principles are in here, like I was saying, you have the reservoir and the pump, uh, and then as you work in the loop, you can add more radiators, you can add more reservoirs, but the main thing to remember is to keep the reservoir, so the pump's drawing directly from the reservoir. Uh, but that is that. We have another video now, Hans. <laughs> okay, so we've got the CPU blocks, uh, which is relatively easy to fit in. 
Uh, it's simply the same as any kind of stock heatsink. You will take off your normal stock heatsink or your aftermarket heatsink, and then you'll have uh, four screws that will go in here. That will fit on with the thermal paste on the back, and then you'll have a backing plate, and then you'll screw on from the back of the motherboard. Really simple. When you get into the graphics cards and things like that, as you can see on there, it starts to get a little bit more complicated as you have a lot more screws uh, to fit into place. See if that will catch up with itself. I think you're struggling a bit there, Hans. Okay, I'll try and pause it here and see if I can kind of... Can we pause? No, okay. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Basically, with the GPU, you've got a lot more chips over it. So you get a thing called thermal tape, which is little gray strips of tape. So you'll have to take off the heat sink off to the GPU, which can be a bit daunting at times because it can feel like it's really stuck on. So you need to take out the screws from the back of the GPU, back of the heat sink, and then wiggle it from backwards and forwards, and that will kind of break the seal because it will be, it'll feel like it's almost glued on. And eventually that will kind of fall off and you'll take it off in your hand. You'll have, with most of the blocks that come out nowadays, like you've got EK, you've got heat killer and blocks like that, uh, you'll have the thermal pads that will come with it. So, and it'll also have instructions. I mean, they all have really clear instructions to follow. So as long as you follow the instructions, look where to lay your heat pads over the chips and then be really careful when you apply the block back on. Make sure you take off both sides of the sticky tape as well, which is quite a common mistake. Take off both sides put the block back on, screw it back together, and then you can put it back in your machine. As always, once you've got your block in, it's always best to test it with a dummy PSU so that you know whether or not you're going to have a problem. There's so many people that build a water cooling loop and they put it together, they plug it in, they get their normal power supply, they plug the normal power supply in, they switch it on, and there's a leak. And there's a leak and they've got their reservoir at the top and then it drips down onto their CPU, blows their computer up, and they think water cooling's evil and it blows everyone's computer up, but it's not the case. I mean, I've had leaks before. I imagine everyone who's done water cooling has had a leak before at some stage. It's just a part of, part of the process. But if you use an old PSU, you hotwire it or you can buy a connection that you hotwire it, run through, plug your pump in, run it through a few times or a few hours just to test it out. You haven't got any power into your system. And if you've got no leaks, pad it all out with towels and tissue, or whatever you've got to hand. And if you've got no leaks, then you're good to go turn it onto a normal power supply and let it run for a little while. Uh, that's the best advice I can give anyone who's starting in water cooling, it's just leak test, leak test. Uh, installing the reservoir and pump. Like I said, so you've got the, the dummy PSU, which is hot wired, and if we assume this is in a system here, we've got a pump there, we've got a sticky pad on the bottom, so that's all stuck down. If the, we can't get access to the top of the pump, what we can do is screw in a funnel, or we can screw in a barb with a piece of tubing out. And then basically what we need to do is we need to fill up the reservoir. As that fills up, the water will drain down into the pump and the pump's primed. This will go off, we'll use this uh, three pin connector here, we'll go off into a dummy power supply which has been hot wired. Flick the power supply on and that will draw the fluid out of the reservoir through the loop and fill the radiator. Now it's always deceiving for me how much fluid a loop will take because you can never imagine how much fluid a radiator is going to take. And especially if you've got like a 480 radiator which is like 4120 fans or if you've got two of those and it's going to take a lot of fluid. So the best thing to do is to keep your reservoir topped up, prime it, run it through. As it comes down to about here, turn it off, fill it back up and keep doing that process until you run through. Then let your loop run through, because you're going to have air in your loop naturally. So let your loop run through for a few hours. It'll clear all the little air bubbles away. Your loop will start running smoother. You might get a little bit of noise at the start, but that'll all clear away as well. Once it's all run through smooth and you're happy with it, you're happy there's no leaks, take all the tissue paper and then start it with your normal power supply and let it run. Keep an eye on it though. Don't, don't set it going and then all of a sudden think, I'm going to let it run for 24 hours. I'm going to go off to the pub and let it run. Because if you come back and it's dead, then you just killed your machine. So, you know, keep an eye on it for a few days and then eventually you kind of feel quite comfortable with it. Uh, installing radiators. Kind of covered all those. Okay, I think that, that's it for the slideshow. But the other thing that's not on the slideshow is maintenance, which is a big thing that everyone says about water cooling. They say, if I'm going to put water cooling on my computer, when I've got an air cooler, all I need to do is just dust off, hoover out, and then it's finished. 
Uh, if I've got water cooling, is it going to be an absolute nightmare to look after? And the answer is no, it really isn't. Like, you've got your system like this. If you use some of the coolants, you'll find that you might get a bit of staining and a bit of buildup into some of your blocks. But you've got four screws on the back. So all it requires is just to drain your loop, which you can put a drain port in, and then just take apart your loop and then run it through with some distilled water or some bicarbonate of soda in there, and then flush it through with some more distilled water, boil it off, run it through, clean all your components. If you need to take apart your block because you're using some kind of dye, take apart your block with a little toothbrush or some people even use tomato ketchup because it takes away all the gunk. Clean your blocks, put it back together, and you're done. I mean, probably three hours at the absolute max if you have a really complicated loop and you're all ready to go again for another six months. So that is actually about it, and I think I've only spent about a quarter of an hour. Uh, yeah, I think I'm done. I don't. I've kind of flown through it a little bit, so I can kind of go into a Q&A session now if anyone has any questions. Down the front. Hello, thanks Hello. for a great, a great speech. I want to ask you, could you recommend me some uh, good brand of uh, thermal paste? And how often should I replace uh, the thermal paste from the CPU? How often should I replace Or is, if should I replace it? Uh, I, there's so many thermal paste at the moment, and I know a lot of them are all made in the same place. I mean, you've got like, I think Jalida brought some new ones out now. You've got Ice Tea Diamond have brought some new ones out. And it looks like every week there's a new one coming out. And I think in this day and age, everything I've kind of looked at has always been so tight on temperatures between the different thermal paste. I mean, you go back a few years ago and you were finding it'd be like five or six degrees between different types. Whereas now you look at it and it's like, oh, this one's 0.5 degrees better. So I think the same as everything with computers nowadays. There's so much social integration with it. You can go on there and you can check out and you can look on you know, one of the forums and they'll have... 10 different guides on which is the top thermal paste to use at the time. So I would say have a look on there, have a look on the forum and see what's trending at the moment because every week there's a new one, there's a new bestseller. So I'd say well, see, like, have a look on there and see what's hot at the moment. As to when to replace it, uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I generally replace mine every year when I clean my loop. Uh, I'll take it off and then replace it. Uh, but I don't know if there's a particular time scale in which you're meant to replace it. I just know that I service my loop. Well, I service my loop every six months to every year. And at that point, I'll always replace it. So that's my time scale. I don't know if anyone has had a different time scale. But I think six months is a, is a... I think I'm probably overkilling it a little bit, to be honest. But, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Have you ever heard something about suspending parts of the computer directly in oil? Yes, I have. Mineral oiled computers. Uh, that wasn't too long ago. There was a, I saw a, a log on BitTech uh, from Lego Man who built his first mineral oiled computer. Uh, I heard it didn't go too well. <laughs> I heard it worked. It worked for a while. And then his seals that he had on all his O-rings, he hadn't used the right kind of rubber. So the mineral oil he'd used, it's a way of them. And then all his O-rings degraded and died. Uh, I know it does work. I've forgotten what the company name is, but there is a company that builds these absolute beasts of computers uh, and has them suspended in oil, and they run incredibly well. But you've got to have pretty big kahunas to even consider doing it, especially from a scratch build. But it will work. I mean, it will. it's been proven that it will work. The temperatures are great. It's completely silent, so... If, you, if you're feeling confident, then, then go for it. Just make sure you put a log on the computer so everyone can see. Like, yeah, I'd go, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, I know this question might be a little stupid and it's absolutely senseless, but um, do you know if there are any plans to include a water cooling system in like a netbook or a, um, a notebook or whatever? I've seen some people that have done it. The problem comes from when you're looking for the radiator and the heat dissipation. Obviously, you need to have the fans and the radiator to take the heat away, and you need to try and fit the pump in. So you're looking to try and have real micro components for something that isn't particularly needed. Uh, there's not a lot of many laptop and netbook users out there who are looking to overpower their computer with the kind of processes you need to have water cooling. And the silent factor, I mean, most laptops nowadays are pretty much silent anyway. I mean, you can take a MacBook and put up to 70% fan power and you can barely hear it. 
So, I mean, people have done it just for kicks, but I've seen people that have done it and they have a, like a briefcase next to them with their radiators and fans in, you know. So, so it's possible. I mean, anything's possible, but it's, it's kind of, you know, do it if you can just because you can kind of thing. <laughs> What will be in a starting budget to like install something like that in a computer? A starting budget? Well, if you're just going to start water cooling, uh, there is all-in-one features which are pretty popular at the moment. So, like Antec and Cooler Master and people have brought out all-in-one coolers, which are basically a little bit bigger than the pump, and they have like, well, actually, if I do this, they look like that. So you've got the pump and the block in one. You put the block on and it has a radiator on it and it literally is an all-in-one system. Uh, even the tubes on a lot of them are actually fused on so you can't take them off. Uh, so for one of those, I think you're looking at around 80 pounds for a top-end one. Uh, if you're looking for a system like this, then you're probably looking at, say, 35 to 40 pounds for the reservoir, probably 30, depending on how high you go. If you say 200 pounds for a starting budget for a little water cooling loop, then you're probably not going to be far wrong. Uh, but you can go, the sky's the limit to how high you want to go. You know, it depends how far you want to push it. Uh, but like the tubing and things, you know, it's the same with everything. There's a premium, there's a budget, and there's a mid-level. So, but I think a few other companies are starting to do kits as well. So you can kind of look on there and buy it all in one kit, and then you know you've got all parts that are compatible with each other. So yeah, it's, I'd say if you say 150, 200 pounds for a starting budget to go, then you're probably not far off. Hi, I would like to know about the, you know, it's, it's been a while since I installed one of those, but I would like to know about the reservoirs. Yeah. Uh, what would she, should be the, like the side? How many liquids should, should, should I have? Is just just to be able to fit the pump, or the, biggest, the, the bigger the, the reservoir is, the better cooling I'm gonna have? It's not, I mean, the bigger the reservoir is only going to have a slight impact on the cooling because your cooling is only ever going to go into ambient temperature. Because if it goes below ambient temperature, you're going to get condensation on the loop and that's going to be really bad having water in your system. So the main thing, I mean, some people don't actually have a reservoir. You can run, if, you, if you're a bit more advanced, you can run a line where you literally just come up to the top of your case and have a T piece. Uh, so you'll have a fitting that kind of looks like a T and then the spur will come off, and that will be your fill line, and then the T will run through. But then you've only got, say, this much tubing going on top of your case acting as a reservoir. So the good thing about having a reservoir is you can always see your fill level, you can always see how much fluid you've got, it's really easy to fill up, and it looks a lot cooler having a, a tank of water suspended in your case. Uh, but, I mean, for the size of it, I mean, the... the and let's say it's again, unless you're really pushing your system, you're not going to notice having like this massive great thing. Like if anyone's seen Pope's log on the computer, you'll notice he has this massive like two litre reservoir or something. I don't know if he's noticed any uh, improvements in his, no, no improvements in his cooling. So, so no, I think, I mean, it's nice to have a reservoir that will hold enough. So when you prime your loop, you've got enough leeway. So you're not going to empty it instantly. So it's a really something about that size is great for a, for a first loop, I'd say. Wouldn't it lower your budget if you just use a fill port? Yeah, yeah. If you came up with a fill port, I mean, you can come up. That's what I was saying. If you came up with a fill port and a little bit of tubing, you can lower your budget. But the thing I found when talking to people that were just starting water cooling is they were having, they were using their fill port, they were having a little bit of tubing coming out of the pump and going to the top as a fill port, especially in micro ATX cases. They were having that, they were filling the fill port up and leaving the tubing, they were priming the pump, and as soon as they were hitting the power switch on the, on the PSU, it was draining it and they were running the pump dry. And if you run a pump dry, you're basically just killing it. You might as well just take a hammer because you just, it just squeals and it's horrible. So I always tell people now that if they're going to start a new loop to get a half decent sized reservoir so they've got enough leeway because you can tell people all day long that make sure you switch it on, switch it off, so you're not using it. But at the end of the day, it's always best to have a, you know, if, you, if you're just starting. I mean, once you get a bit more advanced, then run with the fill port. But then, like I say, some people don't even have that. So I'd say if you're just beginning, then it's, it's a safe bet to go with the reservoir. Anyone else? Round of applause, please, for Nate. And that's the end of today's session at Galileo. Join us tomorrow at 10 o'clock with Paul McKnight and Competitive Robotics. Thank you very much.